Bonsoir. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's talk. I'm Catherine Weir. I'm one of the four curators of this edition of Cosmopolis. And uh, tonight, Zhang Hanu will give a talk um, relating to some aspects of the exhibition and her own research. She's also one of the curators of this edition and worked on Cosmopolis 1.5 in Chengdu, and the other curators are Shannon Dimu and Lilari Conti. So Hanu is a writer, um, a curator, and an editor. She's curated and organized exhibitions with No Longer Empty in New York, and with the Young Art Museum in Beijing, and also with the Park Station of Art in Shanghai, amongst others. You can read her writing on Art Forum, uh, Art Agenda, and Flash Art. And recently, this summer, in um, Hong Kong at Parasite, she created, curated an exhibition entitled Bicycle Thieves, which was a project exploring the fine line between sharing and stealing, and issues about labor and technology. This month also, Flash Facts, which is a guest house project co-founded by Handu is being launched in Guangzhou uh, to practice and experiment concepts like hospitality, safe houses, and information exchange. For tonight's video essay presentation, Handu is going to share with us some of her observations as a user on Kwai Shou, which is a video and live streaming platform that has enormous popularity in rural China. And she will proposed through her presentation a uh, concept of low-end multiculturalism. So please help me in welcoming Zhang Han. Thank you, Catherine, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so I've, watched, I've been watching Kwai Shou for almost three years now. And never once did I get on the app and it was not all that inspired by it. So tonight I wanted to share with you my personal favorite collections of the videos post posted by cultural users and my thoughts and reflections on it. Um, it'll be a 45 minutes long presentation with videos and I'll be talking through it. Um, I want to begin with a comparison of Four, uh, four videos about food delivery. Hello, 最后一单送来，下班了。凌晨两点十分，两个小时跑了十一单，还不错。刚才有位粉丝发消息给我，说过来找我了，我预说他是送外卖的，现在在这里等他过来。兄弟是你啊？多少钱一单？这单价一样的吗？昨天买了一包烟，本来一包烟可以抽一个礼拜的，好犹豫哦，一包烟都花没了。跟这位兄弟聊了一下，他也不知道现在才下班，都是为了生活，加油！他 works in Liuzhou, the fourth most populous city in Guangxi, Zhuang ethnic autonomy province. Most of his posts document his everyday life, how many orders he delivers each day, how much money he earns from the daily hard work, exceptionally nice or generous customers, and once in a while he gets really upset after receiving a finger down rating from customers because it means a reduced delivery fee and wasted effort and time. From the video, we see he proudly ranks the number one on the writer's ranking chart in the delivery app backstage system. He loves his job. He has 28.4 thousand followers, but this is not as a big number. As to May 20, 2019, the daily active users on Kwai Shou reaches 200 million, one seventh of the entire country's population. According to another report from 2018, 60% of Kwai Shou's users are from Tier 3 or Tier 4 cities and rural areas, like Liuzhou. Notably, 70% of the entire Chinese 
population live in this vast area of small cities and countryside. And that makes Kuaishou's user distribution the most real reflection of urban-rural democratic divide in the country. Among the 28.4 thousand followers, we can guess that a lot of them are like that fan in the video, someone who shared timetable and sentiments with live streamer, with the live streamer. Kuaishou for them is not only entertainment, but also social media. And um, let's see the second video about food delivery. The guy used to be make used to make delivery themed sketches, but one day he decided to live stream his life 24 hours nonstop. For that, he intentionally looks like a white man, wild man living in a cave. The camera is on all around the clock when he eats, sleeps, and talks to his followers. He claims he's the first on Kuaishou to do that. How Kuaishou works is that each account can both post short videos and live stream. In addition to making friends, you can, if you want, also want to make money from Kuaishou, what, what you usually do is to post interesting videos to attract followers, and the followers will get noticed when you turn on your live stream camera. A time when you can sell products, products or receive monetizable e-gifts. With these short self-promotional videos on your homepage, you have to have your thing and catch the audience's eye in a, as short time as possible. Basically, you have to make spectacles. Interestingly, the videos that the users post are called artworks by the platform. They truly are art forms, artworks like this man in an epic combination of Andy Warhol's Everyone Has Their 15 Minutes, Andy Warhol's Empire State Building, and the Truman's World. There is an often said sentence on Kuaishou, Gan Zhou Wan Le. It is translated as, just do it. Coincidentally with, um, Coincidentally or not, the same with Nike's marketing motto. This slogan, both pragma pragmatic and heroic, represents the ethos of numerous de delivery-themed videos and are very neoliberal and the very liberal neoliberal logic of giving your body and your time in exchange for money and giving today's hardship in exchange for tomorrow's fortune. For this former food delivery writer. Being creative and become a live streamer is quicker money, but uh, being a live streamer is as precarious of a job as the, the a delivery guy. From delivery rider to live streamer, from transporting packages of food that, that one doesn't own to making content that has one's own idea on it, the body is present and sometimes at risk, and the time violently spent. This guy, by having the camera on 24-31, pushes this extreme bodily and temporal presence to the limit. This is the third one. <laughs> If the secret of Kuaishou is spectacle making, and African face speaking fluent Chinese is itself some spectacle. For this guy, his thing is playing different roles all by himself, and that he's a spokesperson for cultural differences, just like a lot of other foreign live streamers on Kuaishou. When I watch Kuaishou, I'm always keen to notice the background setting of the videos. In this one, for example, we see a gated estate property that looks like a ghost town in, located in the middle of nowhere. 
which is we will see a common a common background and background setting in a lot of Kuaishou posts, which uh, might also be a result from an over urbanization in a lot of cities. By the way, I feel the same when ordering food here in Paris. <laughs> obviously well-written script, probably by a professional comedian. There's no doubt that the video is a teamwork, and the quality of this sketch is definitely no lower than those on TV or in the theater. And on Kuai you have numerous options. You who would want to buy a TV or go out to entertain oneself anymore? Having a team to produce content is an investment in time and money. I don't think these guys deliver, deliver food anymore in real life. Maybe they are never delivery guys. They just perform so as to get more followers. But the content of their performances, the conversation and the prank between the delivery people and the security guard are realistic in a way. Digital economy jobs like food delivery and DD Uber drivers have in recent years surpassed factory job to become the first choice of young migrant workers. In 2018, 2.4 million Meituan riders make income through the platform. Meituan is the one company that has signature bright yellow uniform that we see in all these videos. And the other big one, Ulema, has accumulated 3 million registered riders, among whom 77% is from the countryside. So the population base and the, the rising importance of food delivery as an option and as a symbol for the big city job, it then become understandable why food delivery is a big subject matter on Kaishou. However, the person who orders delivery, the one who lives in the gated high-end property, is absent from the story and also from Kaishou almost entirely. Turning work into performance and into spectacle is not limited to food delivery. We see all kinds of professions being performed and uh, um, exaggerated on Kaisho. <laughs> on sight of their job happily. Or if we can understand this as 
working extremely hard is acceptable or even encouraged in the context. And the imagery of a rock and roll band is also a thing on Kuaishou. behind them is a fake one. It is the thing for this specific live streamer, a one-to-one -one airplane model. It seems that he's building it every day, but he never finishes it. And not only does he make an airplane, also makes nuclear reaction. So I think the concept of concept of Shanghai is at stake here. Shanghai airplane, Shanghai nuclear reaction, Shanghai rock band, Shanghai musical instruments. These are two obvious copies that they don't even bother to compete original and just want to be playful, entertaining and self-entertaining. Philosopher Bion Chun Han serializes Shanghai in his eponymous book and uh, thinks that, it can, that the concept cannot be read in the Western art historical framework of the original and the copy. The point of Shanghai, Han argues, comes in the process of reiterating a previous version, maybe an original, maybe someone else represents. No one else represents the spirit of Shanghai than this one. So he, he calls himself Brother Bama. In almost all videos of his, he mimics facial expressions, outfits, and even language of the for, former US president. And with some surrounding environments in e extreme contrast. <laughs> Han writes, the creativity of Shanghai, which, quote, which cannot be denied, is determined not by the discontinuity and suddenness of a new creation that completely breaks with the old, but by the playful enjoyment in modifying, varying, combining, and transforming the old, end quote. <laughs> in Kuai Shou live streamer's approach of Shanghai, with full performativity and playfulness, we also see it's accompanied by an aspiration to be connected with the larger world and to become a part of the big history. They desire to be a world, world game player or shareholder, a president or someone who can press a nuclear button. And they find ways of making, ha making the most of the limited resources to make it happen in a Shanghai way. Another excellent Shanghai creation a video of so-called countryside Victoria's Secret went viral this year. not only Shanghai, the transnational lingerie company's runway show, its products and its style, but they also Shanghai the shooting techniques, the stage setting, and the disposition of the models. Their Shanghai version deconstructs the making of the myth of Victoria's Secrets by its signature in the spectacular annual runway show. I, I, I will show another one, it's, it's never enough. 
I, you cannot get enough from it. Um, countryside Victoria Secret later became a genre on Kaizo, actually. It's not common that once something very creative goes viral, Shanghai copies of it will burgeon very soon. It's normal to see Kaizo live streamers copy each other. However, these videos raise once again the topic of the leftover children, meaning those whose parents leave rural homes for big city jobs and who grow up lonely and have high crime, crime rates. They say video making and being creative have improved the condition of the leftover children. But the other side of the coin is also evident on Kuai Shou, where you can see underage teenager girls making videos and live streaming shows with erotic insinuation. This is Lady Gaga and LV together. On the left, Uncle Peter is a peasant living in Heilongjiang province, China. His ID card marks him as ethnic minority Russian. However, once he talks, you immediately know there's no way he's not Chinese. The way he speaks, vernacular and earthy, with an ob obvious northeastern accent, presents him in sharp contrast with his white Caucasian face. This is his thing and has made him a celebrity. He posts about farming life in his hometown. His question name, Uncle Peter, of course, has nothing to do with his actual name, Dong Shen. He adopts it from his grand -great, great grandparents, the Pietros, who fled the October Revolution to Manchuria. And on the right, Yi Bo is an international student from Somali. Not only is he fluent in Chinese, his thing is that he also speaks a perfect Northeastern accent which makes the brotherhood of these two. Because a lot of famous comedians perform in that accent, so to see the two foreigner-looking guys speaking it is really hilarious. Uncle Peter has 1.6 million followers, and Ibo has 2.9 million. They meet up to mutually benefit from each other's follower base. Uncle Peter used to hate his look because it makes him different than anyone else. But now, he says in the interview, if I can make a living from it, I absolutely love it. Can we call it a late white privilege? One journalist thinks that the popularity of Uncle Peter challenges the idea of racial identity in China, where Han people consist of 92% of the country's population. I think Yibo definitely also challenges the racial identity of the country. It's interesting that Yi Guo not only represents and prevents. <laughs> <香雪啊。笑> <笑> 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 
It's interesting that Ibu not only represents and presents cultural differences between people with different nationalities, but him as a non-Chinese national represents and presents cultural differences inside China. A multiculturalism emerged, but this multiculturalism is for sure a different one than what has been propagated as a mainstream value by many state governments, including China. It is also not a kind that we see prevalent in advertisements and commercial images, the politically correct one. Uncle Peter, in the video before, Uncle Peter joked about Ibo's skin color, and that's not racist. The context is completely different. And when I search who's around me using Kuaishou in Europe, and then if I look for popular posts in the US, the most, pos the most possibly I would find many Chinese housewives also known as the China brides who go abroad through marriage. They post about their new life across the ocean and their mixed blood children. But meanwhile, you also see their everyday life on their channels, filled with details of how two cultures clash in intimate relationships and family life, and their insights about another place. The kind of culturalism on Kuaishou is often a mix of extreme stereotyping and radical diversity. It is hard to apply any existed theory of multiculturalism on Kaisho. I also like the next, you, you will see a Hollywood film star looking Buddhist Hi guys. teaching Tibetan in English. Do you want to see the Tibetan on his nails? Even if you know the hell, because I can show you. But first, you have to learn Tibetan language or snow with me, okay? Follow me. Kawa. Kawa. Oh, yeah, good. who are Chinese but don't look Chinese at all. Foreigners speaking perfect Chinese dialects, Chinese nationals translating between two languages and neither of which is Chinese. Maybe it's time to reconsider the ways we are used to talk about differences and invent new ones. So I wanted to call this multi Kuaishou multiculturalism as low-end multiculturalism. This term sounds weird. The the phrase low end has two reference sources. The first is from anthropologist Gordon Matthews' study of Hong Kong's Chongqing Mansion, a building famous for cheap guest houses, Shanghai cell phones and accessories, prostitution, migrant traders. And, this, and the, now we are going to see a video tour of Chongqing Mansion I found on Kuaishou. In his book, Ghetto at the Center of the World, Gordon Matthews uses the term low-end globalization to describe the kind of international exchanges and local-to-local -local transactions inside the Chongqing Mansion. While most other discussions about globalization are on a macroscopic economic perspective, he said, intense global micro interactions de uh, demands an ethnographic research Matthew's research tackles on complexity and contradiction. For example, he asks, to what extent do these traders exploit their customers, and to what extent do they benefit them? One of the Shanghai cell phone traders answer when asked about the ethics of selling forgery big company phones. He said, if we didn't bring the phone back home, the people in my country wouldn't have any phone. 
the multiculturalism I want to talk about resembles Gordon Matthews research because it doesn't neglect complexities and contradictions. And it's also about intense microscopic interaction. Another source of reference for the word low end comes from low end population, a designation of provincial migrant workers who live in the fringes of Beijing who make of the bottom of the city's social ladder, but also who keep the city functioning. But in November 2017, after a deadly fire, a big number of these workers were forced to leave their apartments with short or no notice by the municipal government of Beijing, with the suspicious reason that their apartments don't meet safety requirements. To say it's, to say it's suspicious is that the phrase low-end population had appeared in government documents to refer to those who are not welcome in Beijing's grand urban plan as a capital, capital special district and need to be moved out of the city. I remember at the time, other people in Beijing wanted to help out with these who lose their temporary homes, but because of the already existed geographical and class division in the city, it was hard to actually know where the eviction was happening exactly and who were these people. And then someone says, let's look at Kuaishou. The disaster is being live streamed there. We can find them. So what you're looking at now is a combination, com compilation of videos posted on Kuaishou and other platforms during the mass eviction. The, the live streamers at the margins of the city posted their artworks as usual. But mise-en-scene of the day, working bulldozers and excavators, buildings being destroyed one by one, ruins, packed luggages, police, wrecked walls, and broken tiles. Escape disaster, one user captioned the videos as such. Another commented, so sad, is there anyone who can buy me a meal? I haven't eaten for a whole day. Kuaishou proves that the people, that people live in completely different universes in both real and virtual life. After the mass eviction, a lot of people align themselves as low-end population on social media to be in solidarity with those who are victims of structural cruelty, but also to identify ourselves as the peripheral and the vulnerable. This, in a way, appropriates and twists the implication of the discriminative, discriminative term low end. Therefore, I'm using low end not as a descriptive definition referring to the original meaning for the kind of multi multiculturalism I'm talking about, but rather, I intend to propose with the appropriate language the powerfulness of the marginal the complexity seen only in a microscopic perspective, the overlooked diversity and the political potential to be subversive and anarchic, just like Shanghai. Kuaishou seemed to be everything invisible from the big city, which have become more and more dem democratic, democratic, democratically segregated and culturally homogenized. And now, um, in, for the rest of the time, I'm going to show you uh, basically everything else than the big city center, or what I call multi low-end multiculturalism. I will pack many things in a very short time, and I'm going to speak less and show more. This is an ethnic Yi girl cosplaying an anime character. Japanese ritual. 
And the Dongxiang people, or Sarta as they call themselves, are Sunni Muslims. It's one of the 50, 56 officially recognized ethnic groups. But they dance as everyone else. One of my favorite things to do on Kaizhou is to watch the dancing people on the Grand Bazaar in Wuhuxi. Unlike square dancing elsewhere in China, on the bazaar you see people of all age range. This young girl absolutely enjoys her innovative mix of hip hop and the traditional Uyghur dance. Really, people love to dance regardless of age. I'm just showing this because they are too cute. Another very young e-girl. She dances in a dormitory. It looks like a school dormitory. But later I found out that it's not, a, it's not school, it's a factory dorm because she dances also next to assembly lines. And a couple of weeks ago, it's Yi New Year, so she went back home in Dayangshan to dance with the kids. that ethnic minority communities dance well is not a new thing. Each year on the New Year Gala, on the official te te uh, television uh, channel, it's a national-wide uh, festive celebration bearing the double function as entertainment and propaganda, where minority groups are represented almost always through ethnic dances to be one member of the big family of China, so it's called. The dancing bodies of these people on a national event is a top-down narrative of diversity. And it's not communicative in any ways. It presents cultures in the cage called the representation. But image representation doesn't guarantee any political one. That's why I like these videos that have a mix of Shanghai elements from all over the world. Rock and roll, hip-hop dance, cosplay, Victoria's Secrets, 
on Kuai Shou, the dances are, albeit still with a little bit of potential of self exoticism, they are performed out of a hunger for communication with the larger world. These videos well prove that one not only is one member in one big family, but can also be playing different roles in many different families. The Yi people have a very large Kuaishou user community. People from all age um, live stream. It seems that the video posting culture is omnipresent in their daily, professional, leisure, and religious life. I found a lot of videos about and by Bimo, the shaman priest for local communities, like this one. The low end visual effect definitely embodies enchantment of a Bimo ritual. For this BMO, technology is adopted more pragmatically while the BMO is reciting traditional Yi scriptures. Behind his back, we see his WeChat number printed and the prices to have a consultation session for one family and one individual, which is respectively 100 yuan and 60 yuan, or roughly 13 euros and 8 euros. This Bimo, while, while doing the ritual, is practicing his superpower at the same time. Superpower inside Super WeChat. We think it's shot with a drone. However, Recording this, I saw he went live. Went, went live. So I clicked to see he's live streaming. Completely different, another setting and different person than the one in the video. He looks like a rich entrepreneur rather than a village man exploring Shanghai technology. But this is quite so deceptive aspect. You can never tell where performance ends and reality starts. But it's not that they fake it. They, they are real at the beginning, but a lot of them do get rich through Kaisho because they do e-commerce on Kaisho. So this video is a nice and perhaps performative representation of a live streamer helps farmer of her village to sell his potatoes. official statistics, in 2019, more than 60, uh, 16 million people make income from the platform. 
up to July 2019, in China, the number of people who consume through, through social network e-commerce, meaning buying things from or through live streamers or so-called key opinion leaders, has amounted 512 million. And Kuaishou is proud that they help poverty alleviation by encouraging live streamers to sell their local products. However, the Lao Tie Jingji or Buddy Economy caused by Kuaishou's official still has a lot of controversials. <laughs> Lastly, a love story. <laughs> In the background, we notice China shipping, and next to it, a very familiar looking apartment building. We can well guess that this guy is there as a part of a state, state project and then he killed some time while working in Africa by making Kuaishou videos. With China's ambitious investment all around the globe, on Kuaishou, we see videos like these made from South Asia, the Mid-East, East Europe, South America, and so on. The exhaust, exhaust, exoticist and spectacle-loving eye is keen to turn to the other. Live streamers who live abroad or on the border offer us exclusive and fascinating videos into those who are remote to us. I always think, I always think while I watch, how to look at and then talk about the other on Kuaishou. <coughs> Once somebody jokes, as an anthropologist, they no longer need to marry the daughter of the, tri of the tribe chief in order to get to know the people there. Neither do they need to finish disgusting yogurt contained in a foot washing bag, uh, pot or soup made of gold feces. Now they can just sit at home and watch others do that on Kuaishou. And they get the information they need. Can we call this low end anthropology? Now there are even live streamers who go to remote places to get the remote content to compete algorithm. The danger is that after the state, will algorithm become yet another hegemony of cultural representation. I will end the presentation with a found video I feel is completely out of my capacity to analyze. On the right, you see a tribe man taste the first time in his life a yogurt given to him by a Kuaishou user. And on the left, a Uyghur live streamer tries to imitate his appearance and the facial expression in a very curious and innocent way. Do we call this exoticism, multiculturalism, or exploitation? I really don't know. I've, I've had problems and anxiety thinking about it. I hope after this, visually and information-wise bombastic presentation. I'm not the only one who is confused and anxious. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anu, for that great presentation. We have time for a couple of questions, if anyone would like to ask. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. That was really, truly enlightening. And I, I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, so I'll start off with, do you think of Kuaishou itself as a Sendai button or Western social media, media, like of Instagram? Like its interface truly kind of mimics it, and yet it has a language that is so specifically different, such as calling the posts artworks and having an e-commerce that is um, not connected to something like Apple Pay, but like is actually quite um, free from all of that. Um, yeah, if we compare it to Western um, plat platforms, I would, so, I would say YouTube. At the beginning, I thought um, Instagram and others, but Instagram is mostly personal posts. You don't make a creation um, that much. But it's more like YouTubers, you, you, you do vlogs, you um, make yourself like, you make yourself famous on, on 
comment. Yeah, but it's um, what's what's I think the biggest difference is that it's kind of a close. It's a very close platform. If like the terminologies, I sometimes I don't know the terminologies on it, um, and sometimes it feels that the app contains everything that the mainstream media doesn't want people to see inside this little app on your phone. It's like really like a parallel universe. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like the Sendai band of the Sendai band. It's like yeah. so edgy, but in a in a way like you described as low end. And I'm really curious because on your ending note you said, okay, is this exploitation? Is this another way of um, attracting an image that of the other that isn't represented correctly, and I was wondering what in your observations, are there a lot of reflections about these issues, about identity and about the other in the comment section, or is it mostly for the spectacle, as you said, and um, very much for the likes or for um, like the e-commerce or for becoming more popular? Yeah, um, what I didn't show today, one of also my favorites are, um, I would call them low-end LGBT videos. There are um, there are gay people and um, trans people on Thai show. They post about um, their maybe they, they they flew to Taiwan to get the surgery, or they post their um, daily life. And uh, I, I I was surprised to see like when you think about um, the population base, it's mainly people relatively not as educated. Um, as others, but um, you would say that this group of people might have like more description, did this discriminations, um, but no. Like the, if you look at the comment section, they they su they support and they are curious. Um, yeah, like the comments. I also look at the comment sections, and um, you get to understand how these things are received. Uh, yeah. Are there any other questions? I guess I might follow that up by just asking about um, filters or censorship. I'm assuming that there's so much material that it escapes de facto censorship in that way. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and any filters that the platform faces. Yeah. Um, I'm not gonna find it, but if you remember the Tibetan monk uh, teaching Tibetan English, uh, if you look at the, his his comment uh, below the video, he says, um, "Thank thank you, Kuai Shou officials." As a hashtag, this is a hashtag to help you get on um, hot like popular videos so that more people see it. But still, um, I think. It, it can be sensitive. Um, I think uh, maybe he does that as a strategy. Um, and I read a, I read a statistics that um, Kuai Shou hired, at first, um, 1,500 censors, but, late, but later after another round, of uh, regulations, they hired 2,000 more censors just to look at the content. Um, because of the nature of Kuai Shou, as a, uh, you post video to attract followers, at the beginning it was even more spectacle making. Um, it was a lot of people do crazy stuff. They do self mutilations in order to attract people. So there are different rounds of uh, regulations that to make Kuai Shou a greener um, space. Yeah, but um, I also, um, I think a, a couple months ago, I read a, a, a piece, uh, there's another video platform called Douyin. I read uh, that, um, Users of Douyin in Xinjiang, they post uh, about their self in a sad expression to, to, to uh, advocate about the situation. But I tried to find it on the platform and I didn't see anything. So it must be deleted uh, very quickly. About which situation, sir? 
about the um, camp, uh, the education camp situation in India. Yeah. So yeah, the censorship in the back of the system is really there. I guess something also that kind of stood out to me in the presentation was this idea of like um, themes that are arising in a very bottom up way, like you mentioned the delivery guys uh, or rock and roll as a theme and like kind of an actual development of like an aesthetic language that is totally without um, uh, like a like an education background, say in like West, like in art, or it's it's very much like organically, spontaneously occurring just based on day to day life. Would you say that this is like something that is extremely new for this particular population um, in China that that they've never experienced such a connectivity before, especially saying um, you know representation from ethnic minority groups like Yi or. Um, all of these groups, would you say this is something that's completely different and, and unseen before? I think they definitely haven't in real life before, but I think on the platform they make it more creative. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in? I guess just to maybe round it off, and follow on from that, in terms of Cosmopolis and the focus on um, what we call technology and difference or you know, diversity of technology or different access to technology or changing you know, the way that technology is used, um, I wondered if you wanted to say anything else about how this is a tool that clearly can be used simply to um, feed into commerce and uh, spectacle, but does it, do you feel that it changes the capacity of people outside certain economic strata and outside urban areas to generate other possibilities for themselves and other alignments or solidarities? I, I, I don't know. I just like the Victoria's Secret um, Shanghai video, the first one came out and you thought, this is genius, this is um, so creative, but then copies of it, and people make great profit from making copies. Um, and um, yeah, I guess this, this goes back to the traditional discussion of copyright or stuff, but um, I, I think we, what we are looking at is a mix of um, capitalist and non-capitalist elements together. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if I, I know what, whether there are any changes. Yeah, this, it's also just as like you, you are on that you are um, sh shocked um, by all the everything new information and the, the strange visual effects. So, yeah, I, I really don't know. Yeah, it's too early to tell. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that great presentation. And uh, thanks for staying on. And we will now present a curated uh, screening program that has some crossover with some of these concerns or other concerns in the show. Thanks again.